So, now I would like to invite on stage our first speaker, Michel. Um, I, I just have to say one thing about Michel. He's the most entertaining speaker I've ever seen. I met Michel last summer at uh, BRJS, it was happening in the Moimilatica. And all these technical talks that were happening, I was like, you know, noise to my ears because I'm not so technical. But then he came on stage and he started um, imitating, who was that? Rick or Marty? Rick. Rick from Rick and Marty. Who knows this series? So basically we fell in love with, we fell in love with him and decided to put him first on stage. So, big round of applause. without the beer, uh, so, uh, but yeah, it's kind of early, I don't know when it should be on this side or the other side, so I'll probably walk just to fill the space. Okay, anyway, don't waste time anymore. Uh, okay, the evolution of React APIs. Uh, this is going to be like a sort of a history with a little bit of like, you know, uh, going into the nitty gritty of the APIs, kind of, uh, who, who, who here doesn't do React in his daily job? Okay, just a couple of people. Okay, so you probably all know this, but anyway, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, so hi, I'm Michel, uh, Michael, Mikhail, whatever. I'm a senior full stack engineer at Skyscanner, and I, I'm kind of a Rick and Morty fan. I like to play board games a lot, and I juggle in my spare time. Uh, okay, so I work at Skyscanner. It's a global travel search engine. We have a hundred of a million users. Uh, there's over 500 engineers in over 10 offices, and the thing I like about Skyscanner is we are very tech-oriented, so it's a very strong development culture. So, uh, a big round of applause again for uh, the organizers, for Jeanette and Alvio. Uh, yeah, let's get started. So in the beginning, there was HTML, and HTML was declarative which was kind of good, and if you can notice the marquee tag still works. So <laughs> that's kind of awesome, uh, and I use it a lot. Uh, so, yeah. And then there was JavaScript, and JavaScript had functions and closures, and uh, you probably read the good parts, which is great, and the rest of the parts are not that great, but still it's, it's a language that got us all here, and, and we do it every day, so Stockholm Syndrome, enough. Uh, okay, and, but then there was also the DOM, and the DOM is what Crawford says that people hate about JavaScript, right? They're actually talking about the DOM, and the DOM is imperative, which makes it bad, right? So, uh, why is the DOM that bad? Well, we have uh, a couple of APIs here that are kind of like too imperative for, our, for, for its own good. So, we get an element by ID, we hope it exists somewhere in some HTML file. We attach an event listener. Well, let's hope we remember to unattach it later. Uh, we uh, attach a handler that can manipulate any random global state, right? So it can do anything. It can delete things from the DOM. It can add things to the DOM. It can download a virus to your computer or something. And, I don't know. And then there's the possibility of an XSS if we just modify the inner HTML directly with a string. So uh, not that great. Uh, but some people still think that jQuery is the best to ever. Uh, are there any of you here? Okay. Okay. <laughs> very great. Very great. So remember who they are. Uh, okay. Uh, but then came React, and React is declarative. And it's you know amazing, and everything has been perfect ever since. Well, not exactly, but you know, uh, we're getting there, and that that is the point of evolution. So evolution is the process that got us all here. It's uh, about it's a process about small incremental changes over time. Uh, it's about emergent, non-directed change. So evolution doesn't have a discernible goal. We don't know where it's going. We don't know if it has if it's going to end ever or what what's it trying to do. And there is no notion of elegance. 
us. Like there's some weird things that go on in, in evolution in our own bodies. We have like organs that don't need to be there. We have some some weird things like if your heart stops for like two minutes, you're done. Uh, and, and sort of like that. And we don't let evolution dictate our API, right? It's called the evolution of React API, but the process that we actually use to design our APIs is called design. And design is here to solve a specific purpose. It's about deliberate and directed change. And it's about progress through learning. So we learn based on what things happen in, in the wild, and then we adopt. And it's about elegance in the face of complexity. Um, design is about clarity. And React is designed for clarity. So we have declarative UIs, right? It's in the name, it's declarative. Uh, there's a, a lot of focus on explicitity. So you have explicit encapsulation, you have explicit state management, you have explicit side effects and explicit access to the DOM. The, these things are made very visible and very, uh, we're very aware of them when, we, when they happen and how they happen. Uh, and evolution, even though we talk about how things change and mutate over time and there were dinosaurs and now we're here, uh, it's actually a process that's focused on stability, right? Because it, before Darwin, nobody thought to ask the question, you know, how did we get here? Because everybody assumed that the, earth, the world has been the same forever because the, the world is very stable in our own lifetimes and uh, it, the change happens so incrementally and so slowly, and things are very, very stable. There's like hemoglobin is a molecule that's been around for 150 million years. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of examples of that. And React is also designed for stability. Uh, so we have reproducible rendering. We have that notion of a unidirectional data flow, which helps us be very stable in the way we represent our data. We have a very rich development tool set, which helps us debug and find the flaws and find the performance penalties and, and fix them. It's focused on backwards compatibility, and it has a kind of a long-term roadmap, and I'll talk about that kind of till the end. Uh, at the end. Uh, okay, a great quote by uh, Dan Abramov on the React team. Uh, great APIs are not, all, all, not only let you fall into the pit of success, but help you stay there. They're optimized for change. Uh, the idea here, if you don't know, the pit of success is a concept that Microsoft came up with in the 90s, I think, maybe the 80s, I don't know. Uh, but the idea is that the easiest thing to do in your programming language or your environment is also the, the most correct thing to do, right? So it's easy to be right. And that's the idea here. And it's not, and it shouldn't just be easy to be right the first time when you write it. It should be easy to stay right. And that's what kind of the React team is focusing on. And that's why it's great. Uh, okay, some features have been deprecated, so more the more the ones we lost, but nothing's ever really gone. Uh, so you can still use these, although I don't recommend it. Uh, we have deprecated lifecycle methods. Uh, these are now considered unsafe. So we have component pool mount, which was uh, misused for data fetching. A lot of people like wanted to, but I want to get the data before my first render. Well, not not here, you don't. Uh, component will receive props. That caused a bug uh, a lot of the times when you're using Redux, where if you change your local state, you're actually changing the store, which means that you're now retriggering this and it goes on forever. Uh, and the component pool update is not that bad, but the way it was uh, implemented kind of prevented uh, future work on async rendering on her current book, and I'll talk about that by the end. Uh, we don't have stream drafts anymore, and this is a weird one because it kind of looks elegant, right? It's, it's that thing here. You, you have an input, you say this is going to be my ref for that input, I'm going to have access to the DOM through that, uh, and it's a, it's a string, it's very easy, you access it like this, this dot refs dot search box, and it looks kind of okay, but the, there were a couple of problems with it, it's very, it made React slow, and there were clashes when, when you wanted to do like libraries that introduced refs as well, so kind of deprecated now. Uh, we have the old context API, uh, you have get child context, and I'll talk a lot more about why this doesn't really fit 
what the what React is wanting to do with, with the context. And yeah. Uh, and we have the worst thing is I think they deprecated Masons. And as programmers we want that code readers, right? We want to be dry. We don't want to repeat ourselves. So uh, we we wanted make sense and they took us away from us. But they're coming back in a second. Uh, and there are so many new features that's been that's been being added to React continuously. Uh, and all projects usually can upgrade pretty quickly. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about these, but uh, now you can do React in a very type safe way. We, we have render props, uh, we have flow, we have TypeScript, and we're going to hear about Reason ML today, so I'm excited to hear about that. Yeah. Uh, and we have a, a very nice set of dev tools. We have the dev tools plugin for your browser which helps you debug and, and find the problems. We have the profiler, which helps you optimize for performance. And we have script mode uh, component, which helps you get ready for the future. And you know, warns you about things that will be changing or that are not the right that way to do these patterns. Uh, in React 15.6, uh, we got a single responsibility, which was the idea here. Well, React was a mono package. Everything you installed, npm install React, and then you got the prop types, you got React DOM, you had everything plus the kitchen sink inside a single thingy, right? Inside a single package. And that's kind of not conducive to evolution because if you want to evolve a system, it has to be modular. Right? If you want to change something about the heart, you don't need to also change something about the hands. Right? So you want to keep them separated and interfaced as much as possible. So we have a number of packages now, and they're growing. They're actually splitting it up. They're going to um, open up some things as separate APIs and trying to get them standardized. Uh, in React uh, version 16, which is like a big one, uh, we had a bunch of stuff, but I'll just mention error boundaries. So error boundaries are a great thing that lets you kind of put a boundary around the component subtree. So let's say here we're loading a, uh, some content that might throw an error. Uh, a third party advertiser uh, is providing an app for us, and we want to put that app on our page, but we don't want the entire page to fail if for some reason the ad was not coded correctly and through an error. So we put a component boundary around it and it's uh, denoted by this method, component did catch here, a life cycle method, and we can set some state and we can react to that in our render method. So uh, that's pretty nice. In React 16.2, this is a very minor improvement, but kind of a good quality of log line improvement. We've got fragments and uh, primitive return types. So now it's okay for a component to just return a string or just return a number or return an array. And returning an array is actually the same as returning a fragment, uh, which does not create a separate node in the DOM. It just creates a virtual DOM node. So you can kind of have a lot of fragments form a bigger component. Uh, in React 16.3, we've got the new context API, and people were waiting for that for a long time, and people were very excited about that. Uh, so we have a top-level API here, create context, which creates this kind of a package view where it has a provider component inside and a consumer component inside of it. And here, the provider component takes the value of the that's the context and all the descendants of that provider can access the context. And here in my button, I'm accessing the theme and I'm applying that theme to, to my button through a render prop, uh, the render prop pattern here. So in React 16.6, .6, we had like the first inklings of the big changes that are coming uh, to React and that's lazy loading and suspense. So here we, we basically get code splitting out of the box uh, we just say react.lazy, and that's a higher order component that just, you can just import some content. Uh, I mean, you can just import the component here using the import, uh, the, the dynamic import spec. And then in your page, you have your main content, which is kind of preloaded. And then in a suspense container, you put your extra content. And what that would do is gonna, first it's gonna code split it, so it's in a separate chunk. 
and then it's going to load it whenever you want to, that page to be loaded or whenever that suspense container is loaded. And then it's going to display the fallback uh, spinner here only if your network is slow enough so that the spinner needs to be uh, displayed. And if we had a bunch of different extra contents here, like different lazy loaded components, it would actually wait for all of them to display simultaneously. So you would not get five different spinners for each of them. You'll just get one spinner and then you'll get the whole package deal. Okay, and then in 16.8 we got hooks. And people were saying, we want composition, and the React team said hooks. We want code reuse, and they said hooks. We want readability, and you know they again said hooks. So what are hooks? Well, in the classical world, and it's classical because there's the word class here. That's that. what makes it classical. Uh, is uh, we had component lifecycle methods, and you can do stuff on the component mounts. You can do stuff on the component updates. You better remember to do stuff when it unmounts. And it, it's okay, it's readable, but you have kind of the same thing here twice, you have this separate thing here. It actually also focuses too much upon the component. So when we say component lifecycle methods, these are not actually the lifecycles of your component. This is the React lifecycle. It mounts your component, it updates your component, it unmounts your component. You're hooking into the React lifecycle. So this is the new kind of version of that with side effect with hooks where I have just a functional component and, uh, and I use react.useEffect. And when I do that, I'm telling React, hey, whenever you're finished rendering my component, just schedule this side effect to be run as part of my component. I need to change the title. The title is not part of the page. The title is not part of my component per se, but I want that side effect to happen when I render. So I can do that by scheduling an effect. And that method shift, more than the, the better syntax in my opinion, more than that you don't have to repeat yourself with uh, two different invocations of the same thing. Uh, you can extract that to a custom book, and I'll talk about that in a second. But basically, more than that, it's that mental shift from, hey, uh, this is my component life cycle, to the mental shift to, okay, I'm cooking into the React uh, lifetime, so runtime, and I want React to do this thing for me whenever it's appropriate, so I'm scheduling a side effect. Uh, and yeah, look at it, Morty. It just looks you in Morty. Anyway, uh, and we have notion of state, right, in React. We, if you wanted to do state, you kind of have to use a class, and a lot of people, including me, were like, mm, I don't want to do that. Uh, so here we have some state, we declare it, we have a function that sets the state, and then we have a small privacy warning thing that we're stealing your information or just borrowing it. Uh, and then you can dismiss that by clicking. Uh, and that's cool, that's okay. It's kind of readable, it's declarative, it's all good nice things. But you can also do that with a higher order component. And this is a uh, with state, is part of the recompose library. Uh, it was developed by Andrew Clark, uh, Clark, who is now on the React team. And it takes, so we, we create a higher order component factory called with using with state. We pass in two strings, the name of our state and the name of our state setter, and we pass in the default value for that state. And then, whenever we wrap our component with the with scene toggle, uh, we get two additional props, and that it, it, these are the scene and the set scene uh, things that we declared on the top. So now we can use them, and we can use the scene state if we just be false in the beginning, and then if we click the button, it would set scene true, and that would trigger the re-render, which is nice. And hooks 
took that API, took the same idea of scene and set scene, and kind of made it better, because now you don't have to double declare all these things. You don't have an extra component in your, uh, in your tree where there's just a component that deals with that specific thing. It's inside your component. You just say React use state, and you can use that state. And the rest of the component is exactly the same, right? So there's no extra prop be props being injected. There's no extra component. Uh, yeah, so it's it's cooks everywhere, and I literally mean kind of everywhere because you you have your uh, you have your render props context, right? This is the new uh, render props or the new context API and we want to consume the theme, okay, but we also want to consume some translations. And now this kind of becomes the old JavaScript pyramid of doom where people, when people started writing Node.js, they were like sharing these Christmas trees of just nested functions going in. Uh, and, and that doesn't look very, very good, but with hooks, it becomes ultra convenient, right? It's just this we reduce all of this to just these two lines here. We just say use context, and it gets the context, we pass in the context, for the context uh, object here, and we get our theme and our translations. So we can use multiple contexts, we can mix like state and context, and just use whatever we want. It's pretty, pretty nice. Uh, so hooks all the things, and uh, hooks are another pull by Dan Abramov, Hooks are like functional mixins that let you create and compose your own abstractions. What is he talking about? Well, you can write custom hooks, right? So uh, you can write custom hooks. So here we are, here we are having a, a profile editor component or something like that. And we say, well, we, I want to get the current user. So a custom hook needs to start with the use thing. Uh, it's just a convention. Uh, but there's no linter, so. Uh, do that, and uh, it returns to us the user. It probably uses context underneath, but we don't care. It's our custom book. We use it in the company. Somebody wrote it like five years ago. Nobody cares. Uh, and we have a use user avatar here. And as a uh, argument to this function, we pass in some some part of the user, let's say the ID here. And we, we get two, two things. We get the avatar URL and the upload new avatar uh, setter. This looks like set state. It probably uses set state underneath, but it does more than that. We know because we told this one upload new avatar. So it not only sets the state for the current component, it actually propagates that state where it triggers an upload to the server or whatever we need to happen at this point. So here we just return the output, we show the avatar, and we have a input field like a type file. When the file is selected, we trigger the upload. And this is pretty, pretty terse, pretty nice. And this all, all of this is encapsulated within these two hooks. And some people, when hooks came out, were like, oh, why does it have to be functions? Couldn't have been decorators? Couldn't, couldn't, have, couldn't you have done it some other way? Well. Decorators can do this. You can get the output of one of the decorators and pass it as the input to the other decorator, right? So there are some limitations using hooks. You can call them conditionally, although that's also kind of a good thing because if you call them conditionally, that exponentially grows the number of possible states your component can be in. So making that uh, restriction actually kind of enables you to think less about the number of possible states or components in the end. Uh, okay, so the power of hooks. They reduce unnecessary component testing. They reduce unnecessary re-rendering. They improve logic sharing and code reviews from custom hooks. They improve performance and readability. And they enable a more functional style, which kind of, you know, I'm glad about. Uh, okay, so hooks seems like it's the one pattern to rule them all. Everything is going to be hooks from now on. Uh, and you know you have your React programmer, and there's the new hooks, and your legacy project just doesn't look cool anymore. Uh, so uh, yeah, but it's a hard decision, right? You either you want to write some production code and make some money off your product, or you want to refactor all your code base like a million lines to use hooks, and that doesn't always kind of work. It's hard, right? And even though it's React is easy to upgrade, uh, you just can you have to make that decision. Are you going to Gone. You can upgrade the version, but hooks don't, you know, just magically appear in your code. Uh, okay, and not so fast hooks, right? Because 
not everything can be expressed as a hook. There are some limitations to where hooks can be applied. And we've seen actually some of them already, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So the context provider error boundaries cannot be hooks, react lazy and these higher order components like React Metal and some more. Uh, and of course hooks are is just hooks are just a pattern, right? And patterns are just tools. So there are appropriate situations to use all of these patterns for us. Uh, <laughs> So you have higher order components, you have container components, render props, and hooks. So let's fit them all together, let's fight them. Uh, so hooks against higher order components, well, you can delegate to higher order components. That's kind of their thing. So if you, if you have a hook that just adds stuff to your component, uh, like adding the split state is a good example of that, it enhances your component a little bit, then probably you, you can do it with a hook. But if you have a template uh, component that uh, a component expects a template component, here we have a data list, and we want that data list to visualize each element with our own custom item template. So that's better expressed as a higher order component. And some things just cannot correctly be implemented in scopes because, and I'll tell you why in a second. So React Memo. Uh, which basically controls the rendering of our component. So React Memo is like pure components, but for functional components. So it would only re-render if the props change. And React Lazy is what we've seen enables lazy loading. So this cannot be a hook. Uh, render props, kind of the same thing. If you're just using a render prop to access some dynamic value, like we have in the context API, you can replace that with a hook. But if you are uh, if you're if you're getting delegated to, so again the data list example, you have a data list and it says how should I render your item, right? These two look kind of very similar, but are a little bit different. I'm not going to talk about the differences because it take a while. But yeah, you can do that here. You have more control in this example, suffice to say, uh, because here you don't know. I mean, you you're kind of at the mercy of the high level component as to what it props you get past, and here you can kind of make your own choice. Okay, so why can't things be hooks, right? I want everything to be a hook. Well, some, some things just have very explicit, very specific meaning in the tree structure, and their position in the tree affects where, their position in the tree affects how things happen beneath or above them. So the suspense container, everything within it, is going to get suspended, or if it gets suspended, we're going to see the fallback for it. Error boundaries, if I put the error boundary, if I had a hook for the error boundary, that means like a custom hook that somebody else wrote can catch my error that I'm expecting to get and kind of hide it from me because they're saying, hmm, I caught an error, I don't know what to do with it, so I'm just gonna, you know, shove it under the rug. Uh, and that's not good. We shouldn't there. Uh, and the context provider, kind of the same thing. It gives you access to a thingy that you want to be visible in the tree structure. Uh, so another quote by Dan Abramoff, a hook should not be able to hide uh, effects without them being reflected in the tree structure, right? So we, that's a very, very nice uh, distinction and very much makes it explicit what can be a hook and what cannot. It's about visibility, it's about clarity. So if it's clear that this thing affects the tree structure in any way, it should not be a hook. Anything else can probably be made into a hook. Uh, okay, and a couple of words about the APIs that are coming soon. And you can actually experiment with these today if you are you know, psyched about them. Uh, we have concurrent mode coming, which is basically another word for async rendering. And they used to call it async mode, but they changed it because concurrent sounds fancier. Uh, and we have suspense, which is basically sync data fetching. And I put sync in quotes because it's not actually synchronous, right? That's not a good thing. But the API looks like it's synchronous. So it kind of cheats a little bit and makes it look better than it actually is underneath. Uh, okay, so async rendering. Why is that a good thing? Well, it allows rendering to happen in multiple event contexts. So here we have our page, our application, and we have some very important interactive content. But we are loading some low priority content that might be, like again, yeah, an advertiser is a good example here. You might be loading an ad, and that ad might have like a million don't knows. They're just 
crazy doing animations in React and doing weird stuff that they should be doing. And for some reason, that just blocks your entire uh, tree and you, you want to render. And every time you press a button, it re-renders that. So now you're like, your application stutters and glitches. Uh, well, with, with the concurrent mode API, which is still unstable, but we can use it, uh, we get the possibility for that specific part of our tree to be rendered separately. And we can say, well, this is low priority, so don't, don't bother, render my main content first, make that interactive at any time, and the other thing, if you have time, just render it whenever. Uh, and synchronous data fetching, well, again, uh, you've probably seen the talks at React Conference, so this is just a kind of a, a demo slide. This is the demo from the documentation, actually. So here we have a uh, thing, a package called React Cache, and in the open days it would be in the React package but now it's a separate thing, so you can actually make your own, and there are, now I've seen a couple of different versions of, of React, I think there's like uh, suspense, fetch suspense or something like that, there's a package that kind of tries to do the same thing. So here, we're declaring a resource, uh, and that's just a cache for that resource, so it's just basically an object that holds the values, uh, and we have that read API, which accepts an ID, and here, this, looks very synchronous, right? right? We're just getting a to-do from, we're just calling read and we're getting it directly and we're rendering the title of that to-do, right? But we know that this actually, the fetch here, goes to the server, so what, what gives? And in order for this to work, we have to wrap that again in a suspense container. When we do that, what actually happens is whenever this to-do triggers, this line here is executed, this goes to the server, because we don't have the data yet, and it actually throws a promise to React. So that's something that uh, there was a talk uh, at the React conference about algebraic effects, and that's kind of a limitation of that, because JavaScript doesn't have algebraic effects, but you can use the, um, you can use the exception mechanism to kind of simulate algebraic effects. So we throw a capability, we throw a promise, and React inside this React.Suspense container captures that promise and says, okay, whenever that's done, I'm going to uh, re-render uh, with, with the data that you've got. So that's kind of the whole shebang. Okay, uh, just to reiterate, the main point of my talk is great APIs, which is the quote from that neighbor mom, great APIs not only let you fall into a bit of success, but help you stay there. They are optimized for change. Uh, and I see that you're all cooked now. Uh, so yeah, thanks and enjoy the time. Thank you, Misha. So now, what's next is we're going to have a short panel discussion, questions and answers about Misha's talk on stage. So. Uh, by the way, I saw you, we have pretty good activity on Twitter, so just a kind reminder, we have a hashtag, react.com, please use it, make some noise, and let's give it a round of applause to our panelists. Okay, Kasi, you should start. <laughs> so, uh, this was the talk by Misho on the evolution of React APIs. Um, just a reminder to the speakers that the thing that we're doing now will be part of a podcast episode. So when I ask questions, don't answer with yes and no, <laughs> because then the podcast will be really short. Uh, so, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no. So, you're talking about evolution. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of this a bit of vague question. But do you think that the evolution may happen in, in small companies? Because we saw that, for example, Ang working for Google, React in Facebook. Is it really possible to have evolution in, in our industry in, in, in some small companies solving small problems? Well, Vue came from like, one guy that wrote Vue, so. Uh, and uh, I think like the, the main thing, like, being more philosophical and getting into like the, the, the evolutionary part of it. Uh, 
in evolution, selection and uh, mutation are completely independent. So mutation just happens all over the place, sometimes randomly, and then there is this thing called selection, which is just whoever survives, survives. Right? So it, big companies like Microsoft had Atlas back in the day, like a framework that was everybody predicted is going to be huge. You haven't heard of it, right? In the 2000s, right? So nobody heard of it because it just died, right? It wasn't adopted. And jQuery was developed by some guy, and it still lives on, and you have people today that still prefer jQuery already. So, yeah, evolution can happen anywhere. Is it easier for bigger companies to force evolution? Maybe. Uh, one question I have is like, I mean, I'm doing React for all these years, you guys as well, and for me, like the hooks and all this seems like a very natural evolution because when I see them, I see what they're placing like a couple of steps behind. But I've noticed that uh, for a lot of like new people, they get very confused because now like the API service point of React is getting a lot bigger, and they're like, okay, should I use A, B, C, or D? Well, yeah, I mean, it's like starting to watch Game of Thrones like from the late season, right? So there's all these, all this setup that's there, and if you just tune in and like, who's this guy? Why is this lady doing that or whatever, like, and it's hard, right? Of course, this, the service has grown. It, it's up to a company's culture. So if you're just learning React for you for fun, do whatever, but if you're trying to have a company that uh, has a specific set of rules and ways and patterns that they use, that's kind of up to you to help your help your employees and help the people who are working on your project uh, get that specific service area that you need, right, for, for your project. And that, like it's, we say that somebody should be T-shaped, right, so you should have broad knowledge about many things and deep knowledge in some things, right, so um, it's kind of a trade-off. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, this a little bit. Uh, what's your strategy for bringing the new stuff? Um, I'm asking this because right now, for example, we are uh, our applications are quite big, and we don't want to spend time like refactoring stuff. And what we're planning to do is just to write new stuff with codes, for example, but just the the other ones with the rest of the, uh, with the old APIs. Do you have any other like, strategy for this? Well, that's, that, that's kind of the strategy, and that's kind of the backwards compatibility part that I talked about, the stability part that I talked about. Even though we have new things and the new patterns are kind of better in some ways, you don't have to kind of jump the shark and do everything right away, right? So you can basically, uh, you know, new stuff, you develop with hooks, and one of the good things is that it's pretty easy to just update to the version that has hooks, right? So you can start using that version, and you can start introducing hooks in your new code, and then if something feels very painful the way it was written, like, back in 2015, which is like ancient, ancient times in, in front end, uh, so if something feels, feels painful, then just refactor that painful bit first, and then see how it goes from there. But yeah, I mean, that's the, the guy with you know the hard choice to make. Should I write the code or should I refactor? Um, yeah. Um, why do you think people adopted so easily React hooks? Uh, I mean, obviously it's the better API, but <laughs> but. Immediately after the conference, when Dan Abram, Abram was just announcing the codes, people were just, yeah, I'm just not writing everything. I mean, I guess Facebook is good at advertising. So <laughs> kind of. they, they kind of sold it pretty well. And that's one thing I didn't like about that. They hyped it so much. And part of it, it's a good idea. I also like it a lot. And I think it's uh, a lot, and, and you can see there are discussions on, on GitHub, and there are a lot of articles. There's uh, a repository in GitHub called React Future, which is from 2014, 2015, where they actually have like prototypes of kind of semi things <coughs> and uh, uh, call return pattern, which is not in React. It was, I, I didn't have a chance to mention it because 
too much things to talk about, but there's this thing called call, call return, where a component can return return. <laughs> Which is, it sounds familiar. <laughs> yes, but this is a good one. <laughs> So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting thing, and they're experimenting in the open, and the discussion is is there, and uh, there's a lot of thought that went into that API, and that's why I think it's kind of like uh, that's why it's adopted so well. Uh, like one interesting thing which the React team does is they have this uh, favor of uh, uh, practicing uh, features with unstable and experimental. <laughs> And we actually use a similar approach with your project, like, okay, I'm writing these guys in my team, but is it stable or stable? Do you use a similar approach? Uh, we don't have that good of a development culture, I guess. I mean, it depends. Like, if I'm writing a library, uh, I, I notice that library code is much better than product code in general. Like if you if you open a library, libraries are like they deal with all the edge cases and they're like tuned for performance and they're easy to understand, uh, or at least the surface level API is. And you know there's a lot of things that go into making a library. While you want to just show some stuff to the user, uh, so yeah, you want to just show some stuff to the user and you bang it out as quickly as possible. So you're kind of Product code usually looks like shit compared to uh, compared to the library code. Yeah. So thank you, Michelle. It was so fun. Hope to be on a couple of other panels and continue like the thread for like evolution here. <laughs>